It is a special day in our country. It is a special day in our community. It is a special day in the house of God. It warms my heart to see so many of you have turned out to, to be a part of the celebration, to be a part of understanding who God is, where God is, and all of these things. And I think the, the message today and the, and the passage that we have pulled out of the Gospel of Mark especially talks to each and every one of us, big families, small families, and single people. The title of the message I have given, Give Me Away. The question comes to us about how it is that we measure life. And do you place a value on life, your life, life of others, in dollars and cents? Or do you try to relate to some kind of spiritual scale of love, some service, some friendship, balance on the scales. And Jesus came to turn the world upside down. And then he invites us into this upside, upside down way of living. An inside out way of thinking. He challenges each and every one of us to break the bank and give until the issues are resolved. Through our time, our gifts, our efforts, and our spirit of love. Mark records the story. It happened in church in Jesus' day. It is a story you all relate to. The widow's mite. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. And then Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. <clears throat> Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasure than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. It is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be, Thanks be to God. Some of you have heard the tale. I'm going to tell it again. Shortly after we were appointed to the Chiefland area, I was honored, Candy and I were honored to preach the 125th uh, anniversary sermon at, at Mount Bethel. Mount Bethel is a small black church in the woods down the dirt road as you turn the corner heading towards Ocala. It's right there on the left, just north of that road. Now, I was so honored. It was the tradition of their church and the churches of the area of their denomination to invite the new the newbie in town to celebrate their birthday. And this was a special one because it was a, a milestone anniversary. I was... Elated. Um, I invited some of the congregation of, of our church to join. So about 20 joined Candy and I as we went out to Mount Bethel. Got there and found it. It's down a little dirt road and halfway down the road, everybody riding says, uh, are you sure this is the right way? And we come around a couple of trees and there it is, a small white church. It was an exciting time in, in our ministry that we can make something happen, something so special. But I have to tell you, it's humorous, kind of. Just before the message, they stopped and took the offering. Different from 
most places I've been where they take an offering. The pastor of the church said, now we'll have our offering. And at that point, two men, tall, slim, black suits, white shirt, black tie, black shoes, shiny as could be, without a word, came down the center aisle. They turned almost like military, unfurled like a flag the white linen cloth that covered the altar table in front of the pulpit at floor level. And then they stepped aside, crossed their arms, and stared straight towards the back of the church. Without word, without hesitation, the people of their church, starting in the back, came to the center aisle, walked forward, placed their offering on the linen tablecloth, altar cloth, in front of God and everyone, placed their gifts. Pennies and quarters and 50 cent pieces and dollar bills and $10 bills, they put it right there in front of everyone. And the two stood at the side, reminding me of the seraphs in Isaiah and in Revelation, standing, guarding the altar. They started in the back, and everyone presented their offerings. And the white tablecloth became filled with change and bills. You know, I think Jesus would have been proud. It reminded me of the story in Mark where the widow put her two coins in the altar and killed. A, a, a moment in my life, a moment in my ministry, of the value of every person as a part of every opportunity that we have. Did you know that in our world today, that there are 168 billion, sorry, 168 billionaires in the world? First one, of course, is Bill Gates, second is Warren Buffett. And there are 166 more. Remember Jackie Chan? Jackie Chan, you know Jackie. His mere 350 million is subject to the statement that he made on, uh, as a public witness. I'm going to give half of all of my estate now, starting now, to charities of our country. And even though the wealthy extremes are blessings to the charitable givings, Jesus' is point. How much could a billion or ten billion mean to somebody that has so much? The widow gave from, gave from her heart more than she could. And her gift was the most significant that Jesus called out. Let's back up just a little bit. Think about the widow herself. Think about her life and how closely it may re relate to people of our faith community, people of our community around us, friends and family. Oftentimes when we lose a loved one, we challenge God first. Why would you do this to me, to my loved one? Why? But in those times, we all go through the same state of oh. No one truly deals up front with the losing of someone that they love. It reminds me of a story of a man was walking down the sidewalk and he noticed there's a little boy sitting on the lowest limb of a tree. <laughs> and he had a, a, a leaf in his hand. And he was curious to ask the young boy, Lad, what are you doing? He said, the doctor is in the house with my sister he says she is very ill, and before the last leaf on the tree falls, she will die. So I'm collecting the leaves, and I'm tying them back on the tree. 
The widow's gift was a way of saying, I trust God. In their day, if a, a husband, a spouse died, they had no recourse. There was no social security, no pensions. The work of God is the work of the church and the people of, that love God. We often do things that reach out, especially during this time of the year, right? We've already announced that we're doing the uh, Thanksgiving baskets that we do every year. We're going to do Christmas baskets at that time. And we start to think about other people as we gather around the table and are thankful for the things that we have and the things that God has made possible for us. And uh, we give 12 baskets, 12 turkeys, 12 dressing bags of dressing and cranberry sauce and veggies and oh yeah we give a pumpkin pie for dessert for that family something that those families probably would not be able to have so your offerings do pay the mortgage pay the lights pay for the soundboard but the general fund that we have and the giving ministry that we collect become gifts beyond that to those who are struggling to keep their head above water. Sometimes when we don't even have, we give. That's what the widow believed in, in enough to give, even though it hurt. There was a couple that went to a family counselor they spent the morning talking about who they were and what they loved and what they did and where they were financially. And after a, what seemed to be an eternity, they finally said, and that's who we are. And that's where we're going. And the counselor said to them, I have this blank sheet of paper, and at the very top of your little box, and he says, from what you've told me this morning, there are two main focuses in your life. One is Jesus. The other is money. Which would you choose to put in the box? Understand we all need money to live, and when it comes time for retirement, we want to make sure we have enough money that lasts us until our last moment. That's money. The consultant said, what should I fill the box in with? Because that will guide us for as long as we need. The story was being told to us from another person who said there was a, a silence in the room for a long time, three or four minutes. Seems like an eternity. And finally they looked at each other and nodded. They put Jesus in the box. They put Jesus in the box knowing that they could trust in God to care for them all the way out. That is a vote of confidence that God will provide. The other thing that the widow was saying is that she believed in the work of God. Think of what that really means, the work of God. It, it's an outreach of care and, and love given by the church, the temple, as a result of the gifts of the congregants. We talk often of the things that we do here at Turning Point with the gifts that you put in the, in the offering plates. And a very large portion of what we receive goes just in the blessings of four walls, ceiling lights, air, fans. Our air is working in there. It feels kind of hot under the lights this morning. But those are gifts that we receive from God 
and sometimes it, it is a blessing because people who come to us as guests are pleased with what they find. And so some of the things that are the foundational expenses of the kingdom still reach out to people. It is what we do and how we do. It is the way that we as God's children care for each other and those we don't even know sometimes. The couple put Jesus in the square on the top of the page. And the question, of course, for you to think about, not to jump up and say, I know what I do. What would you do? What would you put in that block if you only had two choices, Jesus or money? Because you see, both of them require a large amount of trust. I want to read to you something that I found in a book called The Five Practices of Fruitful Congregations. Because it helps us to understand that individually we are <coughs> maybe small, but together we are a part of something much, much bigger that God has a plan, that we're part of that plan that goes way beyond what we do individually. Five Practices of, faith, of Fruitful Congregations. Every sanctuary and chapel in which we have worshipped, every church organ that has lifted our spirits, every pew that we have sat, every communion rail we have knelt, every hymnal from which we have sung, every praise band that has touched our hearts, every church kitchen that has prepared a meal for us to eat, every church band that has taken us or our children to camp, every camp cabin we've slept in, are all fruits of someone's extravagant generosity. We have experienced grace upon grace. We are heirs. The beneficiaries of those who came before us. Who were touched by the generosity of Christ enough to give graciously. So we could experience the truth of Christ for ourselves. We owe to the same generations to come. That opportunity of generous giving. The two copper coins of the widow could have possibly been an important part of this recovery that she had from grief. Putting her offering into the treasury allowed her to become part of something bigger than just her. Feelings that were released that were bigger than just her. She participated in God's work on earth no wonder Jesus pointed her out to the disciples. She was depending upon God for her daily bread. What a blessing her gift was to God. Your gifts, too, become part of something much bigger than just your gift. Sometimes I feel anxious that such a large portion of what we give goes to things like walls and roofs and lights and air conditioning. Foundations and facilities, the song and the stacks. However, my sisters and brothers, comfortable as they may seem, they just may be the calling card that makes a difference in somebody's life. One more story that most of you have heard, I'm going to tell it again. Remember my church in uh, Hickory Flat in the foothills of Georgia? I had been there but a couple of weeks. And I decided that the church needed a little TLC. So I got some brass cleaner and I was sitting on the, a stool at the front of the church. It had two big doors with brass kick plates and I was shining those kick plates that had turned dull and, and tarnished. And a boy about 12 or 13 rode up on his bicycle and slid to a stop in the circular driveway and he said, hey preacher, what you doing? He said, I'm fishing. He goes, I know better than that. 
I'm a fisherman, you're not fishing. I said, oh, yes I am. He says, do tell. I says, these brass kick plates are dull and tarnished. People don't notice the church as they drive by. It's the same old, same old. It's there every time they go by. But Sunday, when the sun comes up over the ridge, those brass kick plates are going to shine. And they're going to attract people that have never seen our little church. He goes, hmm, have a great day, preacher. <laughs> now, often, the kid who lived just around the corner from the church came by just to talk about life. And from the relationship we developed and the words that I was able to share, I knew that his life was making a turn because he too realized that no matter what he could give, he became part of a much bigger thing than just what he could give. You know how important that is? Let me tell you how important it is. We were there three years. The third year he was killed by an automobile accident. He'd just gotten a, an old truck new to him. Big tires. He loved that truck. As a matter of fact, if you go to the graveside there on 52, just down from Hickory Flat, United Methodist Church, you'll see a, 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 a tombstone that has an etching of his truck. Those brass kick plates made a difference. Remember when I said the title of the message today was Give Need Away? Did you get that? You, you know what I mean by that? Jesus said the same thing in so many different ways. You don't have to give 10% anymore. You don't have to tithe. It's as simple as that. Just give until the need is gone. Two copper coins, $200,000, whatever it takes. You can make it work. You see, it's God's anyway. And all children say, Amen. Amen.